You know, um, the invitation to come was, was really just to give sort of a 50,000 foot view of, of what we see going on, particularly in, in wireless infrastructure and uh, specifically in small cell networks, and um, really to give our thoughts from a firm perspective about where we're spending our time and, and, and where we're looking at, at uh, trends and investment opportunities in the infrastructure space today. And I think what's really interesting is um, there's been this amazing journey over the last two years in the creation of an asset class called communications infrastructure, as uh, investors now call it com infra. And it's, it's fascinating to me when, when a subsector of an asset class develops and it begins to develop its own sort of life form and it begins to develop its own ecosystem. And really that has happened in the last 24 months. Com infra as an asset class really didn't exist, you know, four or five, six years ago. The thematic when you ran around and you talked to investors and you talked to Wall Street was, it was really about the tower industry and how carriers were gonna build networks and how they were gonna buy spectrum. And now we look to where we've evolved in the last four to five years and, and that roadmap has changed dramatically. And the change or the agent of change has really not so much been the technology, but what I find to be the most interesting thing is, is the consumer has changed the marketplace. And that's us. That's us in the room. And I think I was speaking at a conference in Tennessee or Maryland, and I used my poster child as my 15-year-old daughter. She's the agent of change. And the consumption of how we consume bandwidth and how we use mobile products today has radically changed in the last five years. And a lot of that is largely based on consumer behavior around entertainment. And if you think about where folks are consuming and where the bottleneck in the networks are and where networks are failing, it really is in these high capacity transactions or these high downloads, which is really evolving around, you know, full motion video, downloading music, large documents, and other programs that are content based. And so as a consequence of consumer behavior, RF engineers have come back and said, we've got to figure out how to build a better mousetrap, which in turn has forced us as providers of infrastructure, everyone that's in this room, we have to change. And we have to think about how we are going to remain relevant to our consumers going forward. And our consumers, our customers, are the carriers. And very simply put, their needs today are more complex than they were 21 years ago when I got into this industry. 21 years ago, it was really easy, and, and I'm Italian, so nobody get offended by saying this, but, you know, if you had two paisans in a truck, you could go out and build a tower. It wasn't very hard to build a tower. I mean, zoning was difficult, yeah, but you got through it. Uh, but if you had a great location, you built a tower, and what do you know? Two and a half years later, four tenants showed up on it. Today, it's a much more complex value proposition. And so we're forced to think about not only about macro sites, we're now forced to think about what we used to call microcells back in the 90s. It's now called small cell. We're forced to think about interconnectivity. We're forced to think about backhaul. We're forced to think about co-location. We're forced to think about the cloud and hosted services. And then we really begin to think as investors or as providers of this infrastructure, how does all of this come together? Is there convergence? And is that where we're headed? So to think about that, you really have to think about sort of five subsets inside of common infrastructure today. You've got to think about towers, which are macro sites. We think about distributed network services or systems, DNS, which used to be called DAS or it's small cell, whatever you want to call it. We think about co-location facilities, data centers, traditional co-location facilities. We think about fiber players, and in that we mean interconnect, we mean backhaul, dark fiber, lit fiber, and then lastly, we think about the cloud, or we think about managed services. And what's very interesting is the thunder that the tower industry enjoyed for two decades, now there's other components of this ecosystem that are getting as much attention from the investment community as towers got for the last 20, 21 years, or 22 years that the tower industry has been around. And so we consume a lot of our energy thinking about where are the dollars going to be spent? And that's a journey we started two years ago when we sold our last business. We started going out, we started talking to customers. And we said, what do you want? What do you need? And they said, well, our needs are complex. You know, we need to get lower infrastructure costs. 
We need to get spectrum cheaper. We need to get better radios. We need better handsets. We need handsets that have better battery life. Um, we need zoning regulations to be easier. And when they start putting their shopping list together, you look at it and go, wow, it's really hard to be a carrier today. And you begin to sympathize with the challenges that a mobile operator has in the most competitive wireless market on the planet, the United States. And so where, where our journey took us was we concluded that there's still a tremendous opportunity in the macro site business. And if anyone's here to put up on a poster board that the macro tower industry is dead, that's not the message. Uh, the macro tower, core, the core fundamental tower industry or tower business model is still intact today. It works. There's a lot of investment going into it today. A lot of sites are getting built, and there's thousands of macro sites being deployed today. New towers, co-location, water tanks, rooftops, along electrical transmission lines. Um, that part of our industry is very healthy. Now, it's not the industry that it was 20 years ago or 10 years ago. It's now enjoying 6 to 12% organic growth, depending on how you look at it. But that is still an incredibly important and vital part of the common infrastructure ecosystem. In fact, if you look at the market cap of the three public tower companies, one would suggest based on sheer investment and enterprise value, those are largely three of the most important companies in the ecosystem. The second area where we, where we spend a lot of time around is the uh, small cell space. And so we began building DAS networks in the late 90s. Um, my partner Alex Gelman and I, along with uh, our friends at SpectraSite, we lit up the first indoor DAS system in 1999, the Paris Paris Hotel, actually at the, at the PCA uh, trade show. And since then, now the industry has gone on to build today over 63,000 nodes today. 63,000 distinct nodes. With a forecast at least going to 220,000 nodes and some new forecasts suggesting that maybe we get to 350,000 nodes within five years. So that's an industry at current course and speed is grown at 35%. 35% CAGR growth next five years. Um, and candidly, uh, a ton of demand and very difficult to create the supply. And the, the demands around small cell is, is complicated. It's not as easy as simply building an outdoor DAS system or building an indoor DAS system in the Venetian Hotel. It's very complex. And the reason it's more complex is because of what's changing with the networks and how the interplay relates to the macro site and how you design small cell to fit within that architecture. And it even gets more complicated as we think about new spectrum. You just talked about Sprint's new 2.5 spectrum. And you think about the trial testing that's going on right now with 5G, particularly the initial tests that they have in Korea around MEMA technology. Now we're beginning to, to really think about not only is it a spectrum-based solution and new radios and new handsets, we're now actually talking about software-based protocol that shifts capacity where cell sites can actually one data transmission or one call can be using multiple cell sites at the same time. And now you're really no longer in the small cell or macro business. You're really in the networking business. And that's where we're moving to. And so when we think about where this industry is going over the next five years, we always love to sort of get ourselves into a silo and say, ah, I'm in the co-location business or I'm in the macro tower business. Really, if you want to survive and evolve, you're in the networking business. If you're a provider to any of the wireless carriers in this globe, you need to be prepared to be in the long-term business of building and managing and optimizing networks if you want to survive and make money. And that's what we think about. And that leads us to a, a fundamental thesis around convergence. And um, there's a great series of, of summer conferences that the banks host, and they range from going to Montana to Denver to Utah, and it's really a lot of fun if you're a CEO. Um, but the best part about it is you get a chance, if you get on this circuit, you get to talk to 20 to 30 other CEOs and get to hear what they're saying. And the, common, the number one common theme I heard from going to four of these conferences in a period of 30 days and talking to 40 or 50 CEOs is the C word, convergence. And that networks are converging. Network architecture is converging. And the proof in that really is when we begin to hear about what are the strategic companies doing today? How are they spending their CapEx? 
So when we think about that, the first easy explanation is M&A. And so a couple of M&A trades that caught our attention in the last 12 months, you mentioned some of them. The Sinesis trade with Crown Castle, very relevant, very relevant. A lot of people said, well, it's just Crown needed to buy something. No, it was not that Crown needed to buy something. It was Crown had a very strategic asset that they saw that very much complemented their existing DAS footprint and extends their DAS footprint to really fulfill a customer need. It's very strategic and very interesting. We look at Zao. Zao is a very interesting company run by a very dynamic CEO. Zao's gotten into wholesale co-location by buying lattices. They're now out building small cell. Uh, they're out, you know, probably have a couple of hundred nodes already built, a couple of thousand nodes on the drawing board. But what they have figured out is that their existing infrastructure overlays against where their customers want to be. They were bringing dark fiber to towers. They were bringing dark fiber into the urban core. And it's a logical progression that they can take that dark fiber, create laterals off of it, hang node antennas, backhaul it back to a co-location room, and guess what? They're in the DAS business, just like that. So we think a lot about convergence. We think it's, it's really important because if you're going to have a relevant conversation and you think about how carriers are, are putting out their RFPs today, they not only want to just hear about, okay, the RFPs are more complicated. It's not just, am I going to go bid on 50 towers? Am I going to go bid on 1,000 DAS nodes? Or am I going to go bid on 2,000 strands of dark fiber? These RFPs are now interplayed where you have to demonstrate multiple capabilities. And those capabilities are about a delivery, a delivery system of bandwidth. And that's when we get back to this fundamental concept of are we in the networking business or not? So we think a lot about that. And so the, the, the headline on that of convergence is you look at the M&A trades that are happening and then you look at what your customers are telling you. And when we put those two things together, what we see is that infrastructure providers today are no longer single trick ponies. You've got to be in the business of the ability to deliver macro sites, small cell, backhaul, co-location, and to a certain degree, hosted services. So those are some of the things that, that we think about in terms of the convergence thematic. Um, I think that as a part of that, what's very interesting is, is we've been doing a, a little bit of reading and it's early days around what 5G looks like. And what was interesting is when 3G Spectrum was put out, it was very clear 10 years ago sort of what our mandate was as an industry. We had a very clear sense of this was the amount of macros you got to build. Here's the market-based opportunity. Everyone out and raised capital. And it was a real boom time for the tower industry from sort of 2002 all the way to 2010. And then we saw 4G come along. And we saw the propagation characteristics of that spectrum, those radios. And we began to realize that it was no longer about delivering just macro sites. It was about delivering macro, densification, thinking about how to shift capacity to the, to the, to the fringe of the network. And really we began to, 4G was the first time we really thought as an industry about how to deal with connectivity and the broadband crunches that we see in peak times and off-peak. And the metric behind that was it used to be there was a huge gap between peak and off-peak. And if you've ever looked at the root metrics of what happens to a network in off-peak hours and what happens in peak hours, what happened is once we moved to 4G, peak time and non-peak time began to move closer together. And what we found out is there was a spreading of usage over the network. And it wasn't so much that the networks were just congested early in the morning and late in the afternoon when kids come home from school. What we found out is that consumers were now using wireless devices throughout the entire day. And this comes all the way back to where we started, which is the progression of infrastructure is more about a story of the consumer driving where infrastructure needs to be built not the OEMs, not the FCC, and not the carriers. If you think about the progression from analog to 5G and where we've come as, as a journey, each transition, these are about eight-year cycles, right? So I, I got started in the business in 1994. I've just dated myself. And if you think about why analog cell phones worked, it was the allure of being able to make a phone call anywhere, right? So it wasn't so much about the device and it wasn't so much about the spectrum. It was, hey, I got a phone. Isn't this cool? 
And so that was the, that was the thematic around 1G, I guess we could call it. I don't know, Sharp, what do we call it? 1G, analog? Uh, analog, amps, 1G. analog amps 1G, okay. And then this phenomenon came along, which was 2G, which was digital PCS. Now that story was totally different because at that point there were handsets for everyone. Um, we had handsets from Europe, handsets from, from Asia. And what do you know, everyone could own a cell phone. And then it was just about providing cell phones to everybody. And then 3G came along, which was this notion of text and data delivery. And then we began to see a totally different phenomenon to the network, which was the advent of a product that changed the market, which was the iPhone. And then we progressed further to 4G, which we just talked about, which is how do you deal with network congestion? And how do you deal with taking devices that are clogging and congesting the network and creating the ability for networks to work in peak and off-peak hours. Then I think forward and I go forward to 5G and I say, with 5G, it's gonna be a totally different ballgame. My opinion, it's a totally different war that's gonna be fought. And some of the things that excite us is we, we really think a lot about, about CRAN networks, for example. And there's been a lot of talk about what is CRAN and what does it mean to the industry is it bad for towers? Is it bad for DAS? Is it good for DAS? The reality is all of these things are good for the ecosystem because when you think about how 5G networks are going to be built, you're going to continue to need the core of the network, and the core of the network is still the macro site. Make no mistake about it. If you talk to every RF engineer at every major carrier, they will tell you the backbone of their network is the macro site. You're still going to need small cell. You're going to need DAS networks and indoor venues stadiums, airports. But what really gets interesting is, particularly around MEMA-based technologies, is the ability to spread capacity out on the edge of the network. And the only way you can do that is through a fiber-based architecture where you take that fiber and you connect it to macro sites, you connect it to small cells, you connect it to Wi-Fi, and you bring it back to one common radio room. And now we're getting into once again, that concept of convergence, where we've got co-location facilities merging with fiber, merging with macros, and merging with small cells. And at the same time, hosted services is the software piece of the network. So you literally have, in 5G, the only way it works is if all five pieces of the ecosystem work together. That's pretty cool. That's different. And if we think about whether or not you're going to be relevant in this room going forward, and whether or not you're going to be able to provide services to the AT&Ts and Sprints of the world, you better get ready. You better get ready to be versatile. You better understand how to shift capacity. And you better understand how to provide multiple types of infrastructure. Because those are the kind of partners that carriers are going to want going forward. So it's exciting. I've taken up more than my 15 minutes. But you, you asked us what, what we're thinking about and where we're spending our calories. And, um, and, and we're looking forward to building out 5G networks, much like we've, we've built out networks for the last 20 years. And uh, I think the, the, uh, the industry is in, uh, in very good shape. And I think there is billions of dollars of investment coming. And the question is to everyone in this room, how are you going to participate? Enjoy.